Yes, sir. Yeah. So I'll give you that in advance. Don't worry about that. Okay. So let's get going. There are three of you. Uh, good morning, Praveen. Good morning, Rakesh. And uh, good morning, sir. Yeah. So. Yeah. Let's get going. I was trying to tell you that um, these words are the practical pragmatist. These are things that do not do any justice to Aristotle, right? And uh, I said that the implication of all these words is once again realist. Okay, and that is in the 20th century uh, way of looking at realism that too in international relations post, uh, uh, I mean, the interwar period and the post Second World War period. In that time, this definition came up. Plato did not see himself as an unrealistic thinker. He thought he could achieve the ideal republic. I talked to you about it. And that's why there are a huge list of do's and don'ts, which made uh, somebody like Karl Popper call Plato a, uh, what should I say? They, he called him a totalitarian thinker, right? So uh, it's not uh, impractical. Plato didn't see his own system as impractical. He saw it as pretty much practical. So then the question that comes up is, uh, what are the differences between Plato and Aristotle? Okay, uh, and if you say, why are we even asking this question? Uh, then I will go back to that quotation where I told you that Aristotle very famously said that uh, much as I love Plato, I love the truth more, right? So, which means that he had differences with Aristotle, uh, with Plato. So what are these differences? The first uh, difference lies in the way the two of them use logic and in the methodology that they have chosen. The kind of logic that Plato used was mathematical and geometric, geometrical, if you like. And remember, I told you that it is something which is based in uh, the kind of uh, logic that was used by Pythagoras. Uh, and uh, I gave you the famous example of his theorem, the Pythagorean theorem, which basically says that uh, the square on the hypotenuse in a right angle triangle is equal to the sum of the square on the other two sides. And then that becomes your hypothesis. And then you go ahead through a series of abstract logical deductions. You go through a series of abstract logical deductions and arrive at a conclusion, which proves the hypothesis. Uh, Aristotle, for some reason, was not very fond of mathematics. Uh, Aristotle used the logic of that which is actually called anime. Uh, anime is something that is, when you say animated, I'm sure you've heard of that word. You say somebody looked animated. Anime is in this particular context, you have to look at it as something which has life, okay? Uh, so he used the logic of life, uh, anime. Uh, don't call it life, call it anime. 
something that has that intangible way of uh, moving. And he looked at a society as a biological organism, actually biological organism is a redundancy. You can look at it as an organism because an organism is biological anyway. Okay, so he sees it as an organism that has life. Whereas Plato is not looking at it that way at all. He's looking at a hypothesis how do you arrive at the ideal republic, which is also the best republic? So the difference is very clear. Aristotle's approach is completely, or mainly, I can't say completely, mainly non-mathematical, okay? He sees society as being uh, akin to an organism. Now, Aristotle set up his own school, which he called the Lyceum. Okay, and uh, what you should understand is that the Lyceum, many people have asked me, sir, what does this mean? Okay, actually the Greek meaning of the word Lyceum is a place where you walk, okay? A lyceum is a, an enclosed uh, space where you walk. That is the meaning of that. Unlike Plato's Academy, which is more like our schools that we have now, okay? Where uh, there are some things like classrooms and all that. That is how Plato's Academy was organized. Aristotle's Lyceum was not organized as a set of classrooms and all that. In fact, there is one description. I do not know if this is an accurate description, but I see no reason why we should uh, doubt this description. The description is that it was a place that had a lot of trees, it had fountains, and it had, uh, you know, walkways or paths to walk on. And uh, Aristotle's mode of teaching is called peripatetic. Okay. Uh, and the Lyceum is a place where education was imparted peripatetically. Peripatetically is peripatetics. Basically means again, talking while walking. That is what it means. So Aristotle didn't sit at one place. He didn't stand in one place and give instructions, instruction, not instructions, uh, instruction to his students. He didn't do that. He used to walk around and his education was unstructured the way he imparted education. He talked about a lot of things. He talked about a number of things and he entered into discussions with his students. It was not like this system where we are having me sitting and delivering a monologue. It wasn't like that. He would ask them questions. He would ask their opinions and uh, he didn't treat his uh, students as being inferior to him. He saw the whole process of peripatetics as a way of learning for all, including himself. And though there are 
if if you remember your school books i don't know how your school books are but if they are anything like the intermediate uh, textbooks of uh, c c and now the uh, textbooks of your ba then you would have had horrible education uh, but in our time we had good uh, textbooks and in most places in most subjects including botany zoology uh, uh then uh, the social studies everywhere aristotle figured okay there would be a mention of aristotle how aristotle contributed to something in that area and one of the very intriguing things something that very few people know we say that the circulation of blood in the human body was first discovered by william harvey okay h a r v e y william harvey is supposed to be the person who realize that there is the blood in our body is circulating but aristotle <clears throat> had elaborate discussions on what happens with blood inside our body with one of his disciples who went on to work on biology okay what we call biology today and what was called anime then uh he was somebody called theophrastus t h e o p h r a s t u s theophrastus was somebody who hinted at the fact that it, it's not like we have blood in our body blood in our body flows he couldn't explain how it flows but he did mention that it's not like blood is not like you know you have a tumbler or a glass in which you put water and it stays there he said that isn't the case he said if you cut yourself why does blood flow that was a question he asked himself and these are things that came out of his discussion with aristotle the only place where i have not seen aristotle really being mentioned at all is mathematics so he must have had a phobia of mathematics like all of us do that's why i don't think we did mpc and you know doing anyway so he did not write any books he just discussed various ideas his students are the ones who remembered all the things that they discussed with him and they are the ones who compiled their discussions and aristotle's thoughts as uh, books now if you look at his work politics you will see that the book politics itself is again divided into books okay what we call chapters in that is actually called books so there is book 6 and book 7 and they don't sit comfortably okay it's like uh maybe 7 should have been 6 and 6 should have been 7 and then you look at it again and then you'll say no 6 should not have been seven but somehow there is something wrong that's what you get the feeling try to read it uh, there is a wonderful translation of uh, 
politics into English by uh, Ern uh, Ernest Barker, B-A-R-K-E-R, -E and you will see this, okay, that they don't sit comfortably. That is because the flow that you have when you write a book that is missing. And the flow is missing because of the fact that these are comp compilations. Okay, and Aristotle lectured and talked about many things uh, pertaining to the human body as well as human society. Okay, and even though Plato uses logic extensively in his uh, work, The Republic. You would see that the first thinker to emphasize logic uh, is Aristotle. And you will see this in the compilation of works which are called, uh, which is called prior and posterior analytics. Prior is before, okay. Posterior is after. So analytics is analysis, which is what you do data analytics people say today, isn't it? Now, Aristotle, was the first person to focus especially on the prior. Okay, and it is from him that the Romans came up with the expression a priori, a p r i o r i, a priori, and a posteriori. So a priori is understanding things before they happen, okay? And posteriori, a posteriori is giving an explanation to things that have happened and why they have happened the way they have happened. I will talk about this later. Uh, there is going to be a necessity to talk about this when we do people like uh, Kant and Hegel, who come much later, of course. Uh, so, but please remember that this whole a priori and a posteriori, which is still an integral part of the discourse of logic and philosophy, that thing had its birth in this uh, birth as not properly organized uh, discussion, uh, which is called prior and posterior analytics. Apart from this, he also wrote many other, I mean, there are many other books attributed to him. One is called Poetics. And Poetics is, has nothing to do with poetry. Uh, poetics is all about conduct. How do you conduct yourself, conduct yourself, right? In what kind of situation, how you will conduct yourself. That is poetics. So it's also called poetics of conduct. Okay, so that is, and it also lays down rules of how to have a meaningful conversation. Okay, so all those things. So there is poetics, there is posterior, prior and posterior analytics. Uh, then the books that are relevant to us are politics and to a certain extent, ethics. Now, ethics actually is a combination of two books. Uh, one of the two books is called Nicomachean Ethics, and the second one is called Eudemian Ethics. Now, ethics, please remember, 
are also rules of conduct. You should make a difference between morality and ethics. Okay, morality is considered transcendental. When you say it is transcendental, what it means is something is good or bad, something is moral or immoral, irrespective of the time in and place. Okay, if it is immoral, it is immoral at any time in human history. If it is moral, then it is moral in any time and in any place. Okay, whereas ethics is drawn out of social ethos. If you read early Greek uh, society, fornication between brother and sister was allowed. And if you are familiar with the history of Egypt, you will see that the Egyptians made it a rule for the pharaohs or the kings to marry their own sisters. We can't accept this today. Marrying your own sister, one cannot accept it. But the ethics of that time allowed it. The ethics of that particular time allowed that. In animals, it is allowed. Okay, even now. They, so, what you must understand is that ethics change over time. They don't transcend time. They don't transcend space. And one of my favorite examples when I talk about ethics, and we are so shocked Say, you, there is a person called X who has a father called A and father A has a brother B and brother B has a daughter called Y. Okay. And if X and Y if you ask them, what is the relationship between the two of you? You will say it is brother-sister relationship. Okay, because my father and that girl's father are both brothers. So as their progeny, we are also brother and sister. So X cannot marry Y. But funnily, in South Indian society, we have this whole concept of bhava. You go and see any film, bhava. Okay. And who is a bhava? Bhava is mother's brother's son. You can't marry father's brother's daughter, but you can marry mother's brother's daughter. Okay? But that is as incestuous as this is. So it is ethics. It is nothing but ethics. And in Muslim society, both marriages, father. I mean, children of two brothers and children of uh, uh, the, the uh, two sisters can marry. They can marry, but not brother's sister. So that is another ethics. So ethics are not uniform. Ethics are not uniform. Ethics have changed with time and place with religion, culture. So, when we look at ethics, please remember that he's not talking about morality. 
he's talking about how social ethos generates ethics. And he's trying to identify that which is good and that which is not. Now, what you must understand here is that the work ethics, especially the Udemian ethics part, shows how open-minded Aristotle was. Why are they called Nicomachean ethics and Udemian ethics? Nicomachus, N-I-C-H-O-M-A-C-H-U-S, Nicomachus was uh, Aristotle's father. Okay, he was his father. He had a great influence on Aristotle and his thought. So this work is derived from his discussions that he had with his father, Nicomachus. Eudemus, on the other hand, U-D-E-M-U-S. Eudemus was a student of Aristotle's. And Aristotle's, Aristotle was so impressed by his students' arguments about certain ethics. I'm not going into the details because then we'll be doing this for the rest of our lives. Okay, that he decided to have a separate uh, book. I mean, he, a separate discussion, which became a separate book within the book, which is called Eudemian Ethics. And if you read the book, if you ever find the time, at least if you read the introduction to the ethics, you will see what the differences between Nicomachean ethics and Eudemian ethics are. Okay, now I'll tell you as we proceed as to how ethics, apart from uh, politics, is something that also has some um, value for us as students of political science. Now, when you look at the differences between Plato and Aristotle in terms of the methodology that they used, I told you Plato uses the deductive method, which is you start with a generalization and then end up with a particular conclusion I gave you this example where I said you will use something. It's a stupid example, so just don't take it too seriously. If you dig, then you'll find problems. It's just use it as a way of understanding how the deduction happens. The deduction, a deductive method has to be understood as an inverted triangle because you start with a broad generalization which says, all trees are green in color. This is green in color. So this is a tree. So from all trees, which is a generalization, you have come to a particular tree. And that is the deductive method. If it is not green in color, then it must be something else. It's not a tree. That's what the deductive method will tell you. I used to give an example uh, that, you know, all crows are black in color. This is black in color and therefore this is a crow. Until I found that in New Zealand, there are crows which are black and white. <clears throat> they have both colors. So I've stopped giving that example. Anyway, Aristotle, on the other hand, uses an inductive method he will look at, this is a proper triangle, not inverted. You start with a particular instance and make a generalized, uh, and arrive at rather, uh, generalized conclusion. So you will look at a tree, you will say, this is a tree, this is green in color and therefore, all trees are green in color. This is inductive. 
okay you are inducting one particular instance and making a generalization out of it right now then there is also a difference between the two of them in terms of uh, the most desirable republic or the polis as aristotle calls aristotle rarely uses the term republic for him it is a polis not republic okay uh, and uh, you will see that they have vastly different ideas let me just give you one particular idea uh, whereas plato said uh, you know listening to music reading poetry watching drama and all this is not good for mental development he said all these are impediments in the way of ratio sinative or rational thinking he said therefore they should be avoided aristotle doesn't believe so in fact he was very taken in with sophoclean kind of tragedies and he believed that one should read but one should read those not those which are comedy by the way comedy doesn't mean something which is funny that is what we have made out in india and specifically in our two states telangana and uh, andhra pradesh a comedy is something which has a happy ending and doesn't have uh, uh what should we say doesn't have too much of serious drama in it okay something which is slightly light hearted is called a comedy comedies can also be funny in which case they are categorized as hilarious comedies okay funny comedies so comedy in itself doesn't mean funny by the way but he didn't see a point in reading comedies or watching comedy drama dramas he advocated watching very very tragic uh dramas or reading poetry or anything that conveyed pathos p a t h o s pathos is sadness okay he said one should read these things which convey sadness because when you read something he is almost like the buddha here but not really the buddha he is basically telling us that when you read something which is very sad something which is very sorrowful then you cry okay i don't know about you people i am a bit of a crier uh i still remember when i saw the film philadelphia and i'm a big fan i became a big fan of tom hanks after that and at the end of that film and another film uh called saving private ryan uh which is also uh, about war the second world war and the central character in that again is tom hanks uh both the times at the end i was almost in tears i was i had to fight my tears because 
our people you know when you go to a theater as soon as a movie is coming to an end they put the lights on and i had to sit like this and fight my tears uh, so there are these you, you should if you get a chance please see philadelphia and uh, saving private ryan they are not entertaining movies they are very sad movies but like uh, spielberg said you know that we take the world for granted today we forget the sacrifices on which our present world is built so this is about world war 2 saving private ryan anyway so he says when you look at or when you read something which is tragic then you cry and crying is catharsis that is a greek word c a t a c h a r s i s catharsis is nothing but purgation or getting rid of emotions okay if i don't know if you have noticed you feel much better after you cry if you really are overcome by sadness and sorrow and if you cry and i and I don't fall for that nonsense that men don't cry that is nonsense okay uh if you cry you start feeling better much much better okay and that is exactly what aristotle means by catharsis so he advocated people watching tragedies reading tragic works works that made you cry because once the emotions are thrown out the emotions that lie bottled in you once they are thrown out then you are more rational so this is exactly the opposite of plato exactly the opposite of plato he saw all these as detracting from rationality whereas aristotle saw this as getting rid of something that stands in the way of rationality that is something that we need to keep in mind okay so they have different ideas about how uh, what is desirable in a republic the ideal republic and the polis in plato there is an uncompromising insistence on the ideal republic he wants the best the best and he says why can't we have it okay i want to have the best and we can have it and we will have it so there is an uncompromising insistence on having the best republic aristotle on the other hand believes that it isn't possible always to have the best because there could be a number of impediments in the way of the realization of the best and therefore instead of insisting on an ideal republic that plato does or like plato does uh he talks about a compromise that people have to make to arrive at what he called the best possible polis okay the best possible so this is what has actually led to people calling him a practical thinker and all that no that is not true he is also an idealist but his idealism is different from plato's idealism 
but we'll come to that while we end with Aristotle. Plato did not believe in a teleology, whereas Aristotle was a teleological thinker. In the Greek period, he was, there were a number of teleological thinkers. The best uh, known among all these is Aristotle. And teleological thinker is not something that happened only in the ancient period. It also happened in the modern period. If you look at uh, the writings of Hegel, Hegel is an absolute teleological thinker. And to a certain extent, Thomas Hill Green also has a teleology in his writings. So what is teleology? Teleology comes from the word telos. So what is telos? And what is the telos in Aristotle? T loss is a predetermined goal, a goal that we set for, we don't set for ourselves, but a goal that is set for us by something more powerful than us. And that is why Aristotle has a concept of God, where God is a pure cause, a cause that led to all other causes and their effects. I told you, if you take the cause effect sequencing, then every cause is a cause of an effect and it is also an effect of another cause. So there is no pure cause there's no pure effect. Aristotle is not worried about a pure effect. He is worried about a pure cause. And for him, the pure cause is God. Okay, the cause of all causes. God caused the universe. That is where he begins. And God has given a teleology, a telos. So what is the telos in Aristotle? The telos in Aristotle is the pursuit of good life. Good life. The pursuit of good life is the telos or the predetermined goal given to humanity. So what is good here? We have to understand what is good. Okay, because Christians also have a concept of good. Their concept of good is living a pious and virtuous life. Right? Following the rules of the Bible, living according to them, that is being good. That is there almost in all other religions as well, that kind of usage. But the good life that Aristotle is talking is not that. It is also not the good life of King Fisher, that the king of good times, Vijay Malia, poor fellow. He is in dole drums now. And uh, neither is my favorite motorcycle Kawasaki's tagline, let the good times roll. The good times is times that we enjoy. You say, how was the party last night? Oh, it was great. We had a good time. Okay, that's not the good he's talking about here. The good that Aristotle is talking about is an ethical good. Okay, it is an ethical good and I'll come to this point shortly. 
Aristotle believed that good was not individual. Today we believe good is individual. Okay, we say what is good for you need not be good for me. Aristotle didn't believe that. Aristotle believed that there is good and whatever is good is good for everyone without exception. Without exception, it is good for everyone. And that is the idea of common good. Okay, so good is not individual, but it is common good. I'll come back to good in a bit. There is a typology of governance. Don't call it government. Government is a more modern word. There is a governance system of governance that Aristotle laid out. Plato also had laid it out. He said monarchy is the best. And then he said a monarchy degenerates into an oligarchy and an oligarchy degenerates into a democracy. Uh, rather, a monarchy degenerates into a democracy, which then degenerates into further into an oligarchy. And at the end of it, you have democracy, which is the worst possible or the worst kind of government governance that you can have. Aristotle uh, believes that democracy is a horrible thing. He's in complete agreement uh, with Plato. And though there are similarities in the typology, Aristotle's typology has a few more categories. Aristotle says a monarchy degenerates into a tyranny. Okay, and when a monarch becomes a tyrant, then a group of people will come together in order to get rid of the tyrant. And they establish what he called an aristocracy, the rule of a few people. That is an aristocracy. And when these few people also degenerate in their ruling, then it becomes an oligarchy. Okay, today the words have separate meanings. Oligarchies are rules of some rule of some people. Okay. And in crony capitalism, today the oligarchs of India are Mukesh Ambani, Gautam Adani, all of whom curry favor directly with the prime minister. So this is the modern definition of oligarchy is different. Similarly, in America, you don't have a democracy. What you have is an oligarchy. 578 people vote for the president, 538 people vote for the president. Okay, uh, the rest of the people vote for the Electoral College, but nobody cares. Hillary Clinton last time in 2016, she had a couple of million votes more than Donald Trump. As far as the popular vote for the Electoral College was concerned, but the Electoral College basically said we are voting for Trump. So Trump became the president even though the people didn't want him, technically. So that is an oligarchy in the modern sense, but not in the Aristotelian, Aristotelian sense. So Aristotle says oligarchy is a degenerate or perverted form of the aristocracy. And when this happens, he says, a concerned group of citizens will set up a polity. This is the addition. Apart from 
aristocracy. The other addition is this thing called polity. And if a polity degenerates, if the citizens are not ruling properly, mind you, it's not all the people, only citizens and not all people of the police are citizens. And if the citizens don't rule properly, then the police will descend into an anarchy. It, not an anarchy, sorry. It will descend into a democracy where the mob takes over. The mob will start ruling. So he's in complete agreement with Plato that democracy is the most undesirable form of government and that it is a mobocracy. In the modern period, though, these definitions have changed. Okay. But I think I did quote with you people. I did quote Nehru. I said Nehru also said that this is the worst form of government. And, uh, but he still supports it because he believed that it's a, a democracy is an effective check against totalitarianism of the Nazi variety or the fascist variety or of the communist variety under Stalin. Okay, so he said, I support democracy despite it being one of the worst forms of government. Nehru is bad mouthed today. He doesn't deserve it. He's a great man. We are, whatever little development we are seeing today is because of him. Please remember that. Anyway, so there is a similarity here between uh, Aristotle and Plato. The dissimilarity is in Plato saying that it is the rule of the philosopher kings that will contribute to the good, which is again a common good. Okay, and he has that theory of justice where everybody has to stick to their own rule. Uh, in Aristotle, there is the idea of good governance where citizens will rule in such a way that it will be to the advantage of everyone concerned. So Aristotle talks about good governance as nothing but the pursuance or the pursuit, if you like, of common good by those who are ruling, who are citizens. Whereas Plato believed that the best, or rather the ideal republic, the best republic is ruled by philosopher kings. Here we have Aristotle saying the polity is the best possible polis. Because a good group of citizens talking or rather uh, ruling the police is something that adds to the common good. I think you'll have a class now. I don't know why Zoom is not stopping me today. Usually it cuts me off around 30 minutes, 35, 34, whatever. Uh, so he identifies the best possible police at the level of polity. Do you have a class after this? No, sir. At one o'clock we have. Do you want me to just continue and finish a little bit more? Yes, sir. Yes, Rakesh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 100%, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. That's very nice of you. Thank you very much. Okay. So he identifies the police as the best form 
of a polity as the best form of governance of a police. Okay, he, now we have to understand the T laws of good life. How is it operationalized, right? You say we want good life, but how will you basically operationalize this and reach good life? In order to understand that, we have to go to his theory of form. Now, please remember that there is a difference between Plato and Aristotle here. Both have a theory, but what Plato has is that which he calls forms, not singular. Okay, he has a theory of forms and for him, forms are souls that are resting in uh, a realm of forms in the period between life and death. Uh, death and rebirth, sorry, not in the period between life and death, but the period between death and rebirth. Now, in... Aristotle, you don't have this, okay? Aristotle identified form in a different way. If you ask Aristotle, if you take an acorn, A-C-O-R-N, okay? Acorn is a seed. All right, it's almost oval. If you take an acorn, this is his own example, not mine. You take an acorn and ask Aristotle, what is the form of this acorn or this seed? What will you expect? You will expect him to say, this is uh, a little oblong. It is brownish in color. It has a certain thickness. That is how we describe form. This is our idea of form, right? So suppose somebody says, describe A.V. Satish Chandra's form. So it's a fat man. He's also got fat in his head, not just in his body. That is be, that'll be the way in which we describe form. He's ugly. Aristotle doesn't describe form like that. If you show the acorn to him, he will say the form of the acorn is an oak tree. Okay, the acorn is a seed. The acorn is a seed and the seed grows into an oak tree. So Aristotle had this principle, which he calls that, which he calls the principle of primary natural potentiality to finished form. Okay. For Aristotle, everything in this world has, every living thing in this world has a primary natural potential. It's a natural potential. Okay. And this should develop. He doesn't say it will develop. He says it should develop into its finished form. So the acorn is the primary natural potentiality. Its finished form is the oak tree. 
and when you define what the form is you don't do it at the level of the primary natural potentiality but you do it at the level of the finished form okay so this statement everybody knows aristotle said man is a social animal what is the significance of the statement the significance of this statement is for aristotle man is a social animal is the primary natural potentiality it is not the end of man it's not the end of human society okay it's just the beginning it is for him the primary natural potentiality the potentiality given to you by nature okay so this is an argument about what people today call fundamentality of human nature and the fundamentality of human existence can we exist without a society ask yourself this question can we exist without a society you can't if you are put in solitary confinement okay which is what is done to the worst kind of criminals when they are put in solitary confinement for a week they go mad they go completely mad even the worst kind of people in society the most cruel the most mentally damaged people even they cannot take solitude if you put them in solitary confinement within a week week is a maximum time people go mad they have to see other people so that is the primary natural potentiality the sociability of the human being is the primary natural potentiality and this is fundamental to all human beings there is no human being who can say i am unsocial i can live without society you can't it's as simple as that think about it and see if you can live without society you can't okay so aristotle therefore talks about human beings as sociable and this sociability that they have leads to the formation of associations and all these associations that aristotle talks about are natural associations so let me explain how if man is a social animal and that is due to the fundamentality of human nature then for man to exist or man to seek a companion is an extension of that natural urge it is a natural urge to have companionship and that is what leads to a family so for aristotle the first of all natural associations of a human being is the family family in those days we today we have nuclear families and that is the reason why so many people now go to psychiatrists 
you know i have seen people elder older than me whose children have gone off abroad and some of my cousins have left their parents here and gone off and their parents have become psychiatric cases because they become extremely as they are getting older they lose confidence in themselves and because of all that they start developing different kinds of depressions anxieties about how their future will be all those things are happening just go to a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist a counseling psychologist and they'll tell you how many people come to them with anxiety and depression because of the breaking of the family structure okay in the us people pay money for someone to just he's called a therapist he or she all they do is they sit and listen to you that's all they're not doing anything more it's just that you don't have anybody to talk to so you need somebody to talk to you pay money and go and sit there and talk to them the japanese have taken it to another level you can hire people uh, to play the role of a son you can hire people to play the role of a daughter you can hire people to play the role of a daughter in law a son in law you can hire people that's how it is to play these family roles that's how bad it is in japan and because of the disintegration of family structures in japan at one time japan had the highest rate of suicides people were committing suicides because they couldn't take the depression the anxiety of not having a proper family or a proper family life okay so you will therefore see that family is the first or yeah it is the first of natural associations it's not just wife and husband it is the extended family wife husband mother father daughter son all all put together that's the family unit so association here is not to be understood as a formal association okay uh, which we have the association of uh lawyers or something not that kind of associate associations as coming together you associate an idea with someone the moment you see me you associate the idea of a terribly boring lecture that is the association that i'm talking about okay so people living together as an as and associating with each other playing different roles in the family so that is the first of the natural associations because it is born out of the natural instinct that the human being has for sociability or being social the next level of natural associations is the village you'll see that a family is also not self sufficient okay a family cannot be self sufficient i mean today you have everything available to you as services if you pay money but not many years ago if you needed if there was a death in somebody's family then that family needed help from other people 
if there was a marriage being performed in a in a family that also needed help from other people so families come together and form the second level of a natural association which is called the village it is called the village because all the family uh, different families come together to help each other out and in this process they create a locality and that locality is a village and since the family is a natural association and the same urge of the natural association that created the family is creating the village then the idea is that you will have the village as the second level of natural association okay the first is of family first level of natural association the second level is villages now even a village is not self sufficient leave alone a village even a country like india is not self sufficient see we are supposed to have the fifth biggest coal reserves in the world okay but our coking coal is supposed to be not very good it's not very efficient thermally so we import coal despite being the fifth biggest uh, country in the world with coal reserves and our coal reserves are supposed to last us any time for another 200 years or 250 years we have that much coal but we still import okay Wait. there was a program called pl480 which the american government gave which was giving wheat to india despite the fact that the farmers in punjab were growing a lot of wheat it was still not sufficient and today with the way in which our population is increasing the way it's galloping i don't know if any of you saw uh, uh, the newspaper yesterday the times of india it gave a very uh, interesting statistic india was all out for 36 you know that right so almost everybody who follows cricket i also follow but i am not dying of shame most people are dying of shame but what is important here is that times has put up a particular statistic which is extremely interesting the previous highest score a lowest score sorry by the indian cricket team in a test match was 42 in 1972 in lords or was it leeds one of the two okay and between that time and now when india became all out for 36 in australia i believe out of the 1 point three five to one point four billion population one billion population was born after 1972 after that humiliating 42 all out so see how much the population has grown 
So the, what does that mean? That means that you have to depend on other countries for resources. Okay, you require natural resources, you require food, all those things. People are worried about food security. Where will the food come from? So all those things. So a village, if a country cannot be self-sufficient, where will a village be self-sufficient? So a group of villages will come together in order to form the third level of a natural association, which is the polis, P-O-L-I-S. Okay. That is the third level. And it is a natural association because family is a natural association and that led to the formation of another natural association called village. And since the village is also a natural association and a group of villages have come together and formed a polis, the polis is also a natural association. That's what Aristotle says. And having said that, which is the realization of the telos, not any polis, but a good polis, a polis that is governed properly by the citizens is a good polis. And when a good polis comes into being, man now becomes a political animal. So man is a social animal was the primary natural potential. And if man is able to establish a good polis, then he, he has reached the finished form, which is man is a political animal. Okay. So you say man is a political animal. And for that means that it is the realization of the potential, which was there as, as a social animal. It is now the finished form. So human beings no longer live based on instincts. That is what say, uh, Aristotle says, distinguishes human beings from animals. Animals live instinctually or instinctively. Whatever they do is an instinct. It's not thought of, is what Aristotle believes, which is not true. Today, it has been proved that animals also can think abstractly, but I'm not going there. So the transformation of a social animal into a political animal is the culmination of the full process of rationality. Okay, so man has now become a rational being. Sociability is the instinct. Being a social animal is an instinct. But being a political animal is a rational thing. You have chosen to be a political animal. You have chosen to have good life, ethically good life. And what is this ethically good life? This ethically good life is the realization of the value of common good. Okay, people realize that there is no such thing as individual good, but they realize that there is a thing called common good. 
they understand that the good of society is not different from the good of the individual, which we don't, by the way, we don't subscribe to this anymore because modern period is individualism. It is now like this, it's being turned upside down. What is good for the society need not be good for me. That's what you will say. But Aristotle said, what is good for society is good for the individual. So he put society first common good first. So if you're living in a good polis, then you are doing things that are good for the society that exists in that polis. And you're doing them rationally. And therefore, you are leading a good life. Ethically good life where you realize the value of common good. That is what we need to understand and keep in mind. Okay, so when we are talking about a good life, human beings understand the necessity for commodious living, meaning living peacefully and living in harmony. That's what it means. They realize that they are a species. They realize the species being, which means you say, no, I can't live individually. I have to coexist with the rest of the species. The realization of that species being, when we come to Marx, I will talk about how he says alienation takes us away from our species being. He says that is the problem with modern society. Okay, but in Aristotle, he says it is the realization of the species being. So what is good for the society is good for the individual and therefore it is the polity is where you realize this. And it is therefore best possible government or best possible system of governance, the polity. Okay, this is the realization of the telos of human life, the predetermined goal. Predetermined goal is living an ethically good life with good governance and with the realization that there is a thing called common good, which is good for everyone and living in peace and harmony. This is the ideal and it can become real. That's what Aristotle says. Now you can ask one question with which I'll end. The question of slavery. People say Aristotle was retrograde. He defended slavery. What you must understand is that Aristotle defended slavery, but not slavery of the variety that we know. What is the slavery that we know? I think America was the country, the United States of America was the country that kept slaves even as recently as the 19th century. That's how all the black uh, population, the Africans ended in America. Mainly Dutch traders purchased these people and or they just went and conquered them, put them in ships. They took them to America and sold them as slaves. The civil war had to be fought 
and in 1865 at the end of the civil war that was when america outlawed slavery otherwise till 1865 it was present and even today the blacks don't have the same status as the whites so please remember that we are talking about slavery in the context of aristotle not in this sense because when people were taken in ships as slaves they were jam packed they couldn't lie down or anything you had to sit in one position and you had to sit in that position for god knows how long many people used to fall ill they used to die so what used to happen to those people who were falling ill or who were dying simply they were picked up taken and thrown into the ocean that is the idea of slavery we have in india slavery came with the islamic rulers in fact the first delhi sultanate was under the slave dynasty qutbuddin aibak okay that is why was it called the slave dynasty because mohammad ghauri he plundered india and when he was going back he saw no point in taking these slaves whom he brought he thought they were an unnecessary encumbrance on his way back so he left them here and these people basically took up the rule and the practice of keeping slaves continued and slaves were worked into the ground in if you look at the average age of a slave at that time the average age of a slave i mean the life span not age average life span of a slave was 12 years so people didn't believe in taking care of their slaves because it was more expensive the use and throw method that we follow today started with the slaves it was called oriental despotism okay where you throw the slave away right so that is not the idea of slave that aristotle is talking about aristotle is talking about a master slave relationship which is symbiotic okay it is symbiotic in the sense that they are mutually dependent or they are interdependent the slave has an inferior mind and therefore he cannot think for himself the slave cannot think for himself okay and since he cannot think for himself somebody has to do the thinking for him and it is the master who does the thinking for the slave but what is he thinking for or what is he thinking about the good of the slave not the bad he is thinking about how this common good can also come to the slave he is thinking about the good of the slave and in return for this mental job or mind job that uh, the master is doing the slave will do physical labor for him when the master 
stops doing mental jobs stops taking care of the slave the slave is no longer is no longer in any uh, obligation to continue with the master this is not told properly the story of aristotle it's portrayed and he shown as retrograde no he did say slaves but it's not a slave who is worked into the ground the master does his looks after his good and in return for that the slave does manual labor for the master right so that is the point that you have to keep in mind but aristotle uh, aristotle is retrograde in one way after plato plato gave equality of status to women which aristotle did not do aristotle did not give equality of status to women he considered them to be inferior in this particular manner in this particular matter i'm sorry aristotle definitely is retrograde and by and large after Arist uh, plato aristotle is definitely a lot less radical plato is very radical very ahead of his times aristotle is more balanced not balanced is not as radical and he is somebody who takes a slightly more traditional view of society though he identified things like common good and all that so i think you've had enough of me praveen nayak has left so i'll also let you people leave uh please do consider attending classes on 25th and 26th and let me know prashant so that i can finish off with the syllabus uh in the next class we don't need more than one class actually even one class is too much for st thomas aquinas and his classification of law so i'll probably club the renaissance and the modern period with him and let's see okay so we'll thank you very much for putting up patiently and i wonder why zoom has been so generous to us today thank you and aristotle is done and dusted thank you very much thank you sir yeah i'll see you day after tomorrow thank you yes, sir Thank you Rakesh thank you for waiting please tell thanks to Praveen also he just went 5 minutes uh, ahead but i still thank him for staying thanks okay thank you sir this much yeah